Hey, welcome once again. Uh, this is NASA at Home Spaceport Series. I am your host, Joshua Santora. I would traditionally be coming to you live from the Kennedy Space Center, but with today's current state, I'm coming to you live from my house and super excited you're joining me to talk about plant growth in space. So this is the Advanced Plant Habitat. Uh, we're gonna dive into this in just a second. Uh, but before we do that, I wanna take a look. Obviously we have the whole spaceport here, um, the most prolific spaceport in all of history. And specifically today, we're looking at the research components of that. So plant uh, growth is a space endeavor now, which is pretty wild. Um, before I forget, make sure you're asking your questions live through the chat window there on the, the screen, as well as um, telling us what you'd like to see in future episodes and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you never miss anything that we're doing and putting out as we continue the series and other spaceport activities. Uh, so I wanna go ahead here and introduce my two guests. So please welcome, this is Ralph. Uh, Ralph, actually, sorry about that, one second. Say, uh, say your last name for me, Ralph. I'm not sure I pronounce it correctly. Oh, sorry, try one more time. Fritchie. Fritchie, okay, Senior Project Manager for Space Crop Production. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, Matt, is it Matt Roman? It's uh, Romine. Romine, sorry about that. Project Scientist for Space Crop Production. Um, so again, Appreciate you both being here. Again, it is amazing to think about space uh, being a place where we grow plants now. It's a pretty, pretty wild idea. Uh, but before we get going, we're at the end of what we called our 10-day challenge um, for popcorn. And I wanted to actually unveil my popcorn. So my son and I planted some popcorn. We planted two sets uh, last week. And I actually, full disclosure, forgot about it and decided it'd be fun to, to open it up here live on, on camera. Um, so we're going to take a look here. I haven't seen this. And it doesn't look very good here. So I'm going to have to ask Ralph and Matt here to, to help me understand maybe a little bit what's going on here. Uh, this was just some dirt. Um, and that looks like there's just some, some mold happening there. Um, nothing too interesting there. And then here in this one, this was, I think I ended up using um, flour for this. So obviously uh, not a whole lot of growth there. So um, I'm probably not cut out for the space plant growth world. Uh, but want to get your, your thoughts on what you're seeing here. Uh, can you give me anything on... On what went wrong here? Oh <laughs> uh, well, your uh, your yeah, your, your colorful one looks like it has a slime mold on the surface there. This one right here. Yeah, yeah. Those slime molds are generally a problem in space too. So not just you, but throwing the the weed on there gave it a little bit of carbohydrates for something to come in and colonize. All right, so uh, be sure to. One, I'm guessing you just underwatered it, maybe. I mean, it looks like a bowl of dirt to me. <laughs> maybe so may maybe so um but anyway that's not why we're here today uh but do want to encourage you if you sh if you send out uh, if, you se if you do the popcorn challenge i'm gonna try again i'm gonna use paper towels next time because i've seen those work really well send us your photos and your information at, at hashtag nasa at home uh but today advanced plant habitat so let's jump right in here matt tell us about advanced plant habitat uh what what is it and what's it for the advanced plant habitat, we call it APH. It's one of several plant growth systems we have on the ISS. We also have two veggies, which people are probably familiar with. The advanced, hab advanced plant habitat is our more advanced system. It has 180 sensors, fully controlled environment, a bunch of cameras, really advanced lighting system. It's like our, our Cadillac growth system. And we are, we've had several tests done in that, and we are gonna be sending hatched chili peppers up working on right now. So that's one of the, the first tests. Actually, it's at a recent test with radishes right there. So there's a pepper. So we are growing a type of hatch chili pepper. It's from New Mexico. 
It's actually called the Espinola Curry. It's a cross between a southern New Mexico pepper that's generally a warmer weather pepper and a pepper that's native to New Mexico from the northern region that's more mountainous. Well, since it has that shorter day cycle, it's actually really good for space because it's easier to dwarf it and it handles the temperature we have on station a lot better than the crop that's used to growing in an arid grassland, for instance. So you mentioned, obviously, we call it the advanced plant habitat. So uh, what makes it so much more advanced? Because I think that we're comparing that to uh, veggie being one of the first, and, and certainly it's on the more recent side of things. Um, so what's making this advanced plant habitat? Well, so compared to veggie, veggie is really just a light cap, a fan, and the hills are all passively watered. The advanced plant habitat has an advanced watering system where it's sending water through pore ceramic tubes. Into the root zone, you've got many sensors in the root zone measuring things like moisture level, temperature, oxygen levels. You've got numerous atmosphere control systems that can change everything. If you want to increase the CO2 level, we can do it. Decrease it, same thing. So, so what's so actually let, that's a good segue there because we had somebody over the course of the week ask us the question, what are CO2 levels like on space station? Can you talk about that? And and why are why is monitoring all that so important? Because ultimately, I could walk outside my house and I can plant things and I don't have to monitor any of that. So, is it so critical for space that we have those things? Um, on ISS, CO2 levels bounce between about 1,500 and 3,000 parts per million. Ambient outside or now is about 450, 500. So for plants, that makes um, that makes a big difference because it controls a lot of things like transpiration. But for plants, CO2 is really basically their food. That's ultimately the source of the carbon that makes their the fruit and leaves and everything. So by having that too high, we've noticed numerous, you know, sometimes issues, sometimes benefits for plants. Okay. Very cool. And so let's talk about peppers. Obviously, we've shown peppers a decent num amount now. Um, so uh, why is our peppers so important? Why is that kind of a, a hot topic for you guys? Well, for one, the curves ask us for hot food. You know, in space, they have poor drains in their sinuses. That decreases their taste sensation, and they request more flavorful foods. From our perspective, when we're trying to fill nutritional gaps in the stored astronaut diet, Peppers are very high in vitamin C, many times more dense actually than things like fresh citrus. So we have that, you know, that benefit, and it's, you know, it's a new crop we haven't grown in space yet. It's a complicated crop that has a long germination time, and it's flowering. So, and the fruit has a, uh, you know, wide bearings in flavor. If you, uh, you know, if you were to trial stress a, a pepper plant. You could get more heat from the pepper fruit versus if you were to overwater it'd probably be pretty plain boring so there's lots of little considerations and factors that go into making these peppers grown successful in space or not cool so obviously all of this research is for a specific purpose and um ralph i think you can kind of speak to this some more is what's what's the path forward not only kind of from where we are today what what are we doing for the future but also why is this so important looking at things like living on the moon or Mars or beyond? Well, you know, we start talking about feeding astronauts in space. Um, historically, we've always shipped the food up from the ground, the prepackaged diet. And that worked well when we're in low Earth orbit and we have relatively consistent access to low, uh, you know, near space. Uh, once we start talking about getting away from low Earth orbit, going to missions in the moon and Mars and staying there for extended periods of time, now we have to worry about several things. First of all, the distance to get to these places, especially Mars, takes a lot of time. So what's the relative effectiveness of the nutrition in the prepackaged meals when I start talking about missions three plus years? Uh, they start to degrade certain key nutrients, the ones that we're targeting to try to supplement, start to degrade over that period of time. Uh, you also have the logistical resupply mass. So not the crews are not going to have benefit of constant resupply from earth they're going to have to bring with them either what they can take in their vehicle or things are going to have to be pre-positioned but fresh food they're not going to have access to anymore with resupply so it's going to be up to the folks on the spacecraft themselves to be able to grow supplemental aspects of nutrition for their diet 
and that adds not only the nutrients it also adds variety to the food that they have in addition to that it gives them something to do and it gives them something that's reminiscent of home so there's a psychosocial benefit so there is it's it's definitely gonna be a component of the diet when you look at how exploration has evolved on the earth ever since you know the first explorers came to the New World and beyond they brought plants from home with them they brought things they were familiar with so it's part of our culture and the human nature to be able to do that kind of thing so thinking about that have we seen kind of a psychological impact in the research we've done on station because obviously you talk about all these things that make it different than space station we have the the far destinations we're going to where you have to transport things with you um, so how do we have that tangible result of, of how it's benefiting them today on station so we actually just um, completed a study a few months ago that gathered the first real quantitative data on that so I don't, I don't want to jump out and make any statements on you know, that right now but in general with our ex interviews the crew they they enjoy them throwing <laughs> plants in space so if nothing else, it's enjoyable. Yeah. Hey, that's important. Um, hey, I want to have, Ralph, if you could kind of speak to, we have some images here, uh, some very futuristic looking things. Um, number one, what are we looking at here? And how does this apply to just the idea of plant growth beyond our world? You know, so I, th I think what you're seeing are just some of the early concepts. And there's a, a lot of different concepts out there. For base camps, habitation systems, early early systems on the surface of Mars, things that are going to evolve over time and scale up over time. And so there's a lot of different either academia or commercial interests looking at studying what are the best types of habitats to design. And ultimately, if we're talking about eventually growing plants as a supplemental source of food or as a caloric replacement to prepackaged food system, we're going to need volume to be able to do that and space to spread out in. So um, when I start talking about deploying systems like that long term on the moon and Mars, it's going to be something that's going to be an evolution of the first missions to the moon. Uh, likely we'll use the moon over time to develop an analog system or in other words, a demonstration system of the concepts that we'll bring with us to Mars. And so what you're seeing are a lot of different representations of how do I deploy and, and, and make these systems. In a lot of cases, it would be beneficial to use in situ resources. So if I could take the material on the moon and manufacture a surface habitat out of that material, for example, perhaps even 3D print it, uh, that would be beneficial. So and if you, can you guys still hear me? My, my, my link looks like it. Yep, I've got you, Ralph, loud and clear. Okay, just bear with me, I'm bringing you up. Um, so, so basically, that's what you're seeing are different concepts. The one that was populated with a lot of plants is a system that was developed and has been um, <coughs> used at the University of Arizona to show a confined space for growing plants. We're actually looking at Kennedy Space Center to acquiring one of those systems so we can do further research in a more spread out area to test different hardware systems. A lot of our focus right now is based on the plants themselves, and we're looking at seeing what are the best hardware systems to grow these plants in long term. So uh, we're about out of time for today, but wanted to ask you both if you if you ever envisioned yourself working on plant growth for space. Obviously, when it comes to plant growth and scientific research, there's lots of opportunity on Earth, but did you ever think you'd be doing this for space? I didn't know this was a thing until you know, five or six years ago. <laughs> um, I, had, I had no idea. I'm, I'm a long-term space uh, center employee working for NASA and, you know, um, just kind of fall, fell into this um, niche. And it's, it's actually really exciting, some of the most exciting work I've done. Cool. Good. Well, uh, Ralph, Matt, appreciate you both. Um, and I look forward to seeing all kinds of uh, green and colorful things growing uh, in a healthy way on Space Station sooner than later and uh, even further than that. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you. All right, a big thanks to those guys. Uh, always fun to, to talk with. 
it's amazing how frequently we talk with people and plant growth is one of the big highlights for them when it comes to visiting the Kennedy Space Center. Um, despite everything else that's going on, people love that. And we, we're glad they love that. We're glad that they see the value in that. Uh, so before we go, I want to give a couple kind of quick or a quick plug here. Obviously, the NASA at Home team is a lot more than just the Spaceport series. There's a ton at NASA.gov slash NASA at Home. Uh, this is the main page there. And want to specifically plug... Um, a podcast, which is one of the things on here, the Rocket Range podcast released an episode this week actually featuring NFL quarterback Josh Dobbs, um, who's also a Tennessee volunteer, uh, who is an aerospace engineer with a 4.0. Uh, it is incredibly uncommon to find a guy who can do both of those things. Check out the podcast. Lots of fun, um, lots of hard work and dedication that went into that. Uh, but that is going to do it for me here from the Kennedy Space Center, sort of. I'm signing off and reminding you that even the sky isn't the limit.